Okay, so welcome everybody to our English webinar, uh, where I 21 shares Will and White, uh, Open Metrics, Felix Fernandez, co founder and CEO of Open Metrics. I give you a brief um, overview of what will happen today. So, first of all, of course, the slides are in English, and the webinar will take, a, I would say, like something like maybe 45 minutes. We will see, we will see that. We give you first a, a small uh, market review uh, 2020 and the outlook for 2021. And then um, some review from Open Metrics. And at the very end, there is also Q&A section where you can actually um, post some of your questions. My name is uh, Sina Mayer. Um, I'm for more than 25 years, I would say like 27 years in finance. And I'm at 21 shares for more than one year now, responsible for the Swiss market. Felix is our slide master today. This is uh, all in all. So Felix, please, next slide. So 21 shares, to give you a short overview, is a Swiss company registered in Zug with offices in uh, Zurich, New York City, and Berlin. Next slide, please. 21 shares a little bit in numbers. So we have at the moment, we have I've written um, 400 million, we are close to 500 million actually. And we exist since uh, 2018, so like uh, two, two and a half years ago. We are over 30 employees. We have even our own research team. And we have up to date 12 ETPs because today is actually a very historic day for us. We just launched today a new ETP at the six uh, stock exchange. And we list our products in general for the whole, um, the whole DACH um, region, which is uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and also soon other markets. Next slide, please. So the key people and the top management from 21 shares. Three years ago, the co-founders, Henny Rushwen and Ophelia Sneeder, thought like, yeah, something is missing in this market because they wanted to invest um, so, something into Bitcoin for their own families. And since they were looking around for quite a long time, they thought like, let's start something in Switzerland. And they actually created 21 shares to have a physically backed ETPs, which is much safer than other products existing already in the market, and launched the first product, which was called HODL, H-O-D-L, which is a top five crypto basket. Next slide, please. So the products launched to the up today, just to give you a brief overview, I don't want to go into details at all. We, spoke, we speak today mainly about the one at the left side, in orange, the ABTC, which is the, uh, the Bitcoin ETP, which we have. So we have si seven single trackers. Like I said, the one um, which is launched today is not yet on the slide because it's so new. Then we have four baskets, one Bitcoin short. So if you want to hedge your position on Bitcoin, you can also do that. Next slide, please. So market review 2020. Next, please. There is a little joke but it's not really a joke, it's actually reality. I give you uh, during this uh, little uh, picture, which I find quite um, amusing, uh, a little bit the overview of the, of the current um, market and how big it is. So the crypto industry is uh, estimated to be worth over 1 trillion with Bitcoin, um, which takes of course more than 65% of the market share at the moment. There are more than 300 trading menus, such as crypto exchange, derivative, exchange traded products, decentralized exchanges, OTC orders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what I thought was really amazing is that the daily trading volume is currently over 200 billion a day. Next slide, please. So here you, I mean, like this, you, these headlines you probably saw, right? MicroStrategy with CEO Michael Saylor, which is a big um, software company invested in it. Guggenheim hedge fund managers, Square, the CEO uh, Jack Dorsey, um, California, a financial services and mobile payments invested in it. PayPal, an online payment system, etc., etc. All these headlines also show 
there are um, crucial differences between the last Bitcoin bull market and this one. The current market has been driven by a surge in institutional adoption to such an extent that legendary hedge fund manager Ray Dalio, quite known historical as a Bitcoin skeptic, um, has begun to wonder if there is missing something, if he is missing something about Bitcoin. In addition, also Rick Reader, the CEO, CIO of BlackRock, the world's largest um, asset manager, publicly, publicly um, came out in favor of Bitcoin at the show at CNBC. As a result, we expect to see more and more institutional inflow in the future. Next slide, please. So general interest in Bitcoin, I, I show you a little chart here because I thought it was nice to see. So if you compare the Google Trend Index for Bitcoin and the Bitcoin price, which is in blue, you can see that there was evidence in 2017 that there were so many people actually searching for um, the word Bitcoin and what it is and so on. So even much higher compared to the price. Today in 2020, 21, it looks, the picture looks a little bit different. The price went significantly up and all these searches came totally down. What can we learn from that? First of all, there were more and more, there were much more retail investors in 2017. And today people are more and more aware about it. And also bigger institutions are investing into it. Next slide, please. So with this investor profile for Bitcoin investors, I wanted to show you that we have kind of a line from step to step, like where we are at the moment. First, like I just mentioned before, it's the retail, the freaks, the IT geeks, etc. And then they came the venture capital people, then the ultra high net worth individuals, private banks, family offices, hedge funds. And we will see the more and more also larger banks like UBS, Credit Suisse and other banks which were coming. And at the very, very last one, the pension funds. And I think at the moment we are a little bit at step number family offices, hedge funds, because we speak quite a lot to those kind of investors and they're very, very interested also to go more and more into this kind of investment. Next slide, please. So a study from December 2019 by Charles Schwab, an online broker in the US, um, shows the different, uh, um, different generations who does invest into what. And I found this super interesting because as you can see, the millennials, the younger ones, the number five is already a top, as top is already Bitcoin investments. So if you compare that to other, um, other um, generations, we are a little bit behind that because if I speak, for example, to my dad, who is normally completely on for financial, he's still like having some doubts, but he might come also uh, more and more in the future. The next slide, please. I have a little cool chart and I thought I would show this as well. It's from my, from my colleague, actually, Hansen. So this shows that a Bitcoin, Bitcoin goes through cycles, sometimes speculative, uh, so too high, and then it falls again down. So every time Bitcoin um, hits a new all-time high, we go into this bull phase for almost a year. So in 2000, to show you, but for example, on the slide, in 2013, Bitcoin crossed 80 US dollars for the first time. Then the price increased 38 times over that one. So jumped to 1,000 within a year, and then it went down for a while. Then in 2017, from 1,100, 1,200 maybe, 17 times higher up to 20,000. Where we are here um, was actually the, the last month. And we know that it thinks that at times it will be even more extreme because since Corona, not only retail, but also institutional are looking around for alternatives. The first one um, have already come in and soon more will come in, like I just said before. So Corona has not a negative impact on Bitcoin, quite the opposite. Next slide, please. Outlook 2021, what will happen in 2021? Let's ask our Oracle. Next slide, please. Number one, more and more institutional investors will come in. Well, not a surprise, that's just what I mentioned before. Next slide, number two, those who hold gold also invest more and more in Bitcoin. 
as a diversification. We know that more and more people call actually Bitcoin like the safe heaven, and also less and less young people, like I just mentioned before with the charts, invest into um, gold because they have completely different mindset than we have with our generations. So we think, and we are almost sure that more and more people come in who hold gold. Number three, please, regulations. There are a lot of regulations still to do. It's starting with taxes, AML, et cetera, et cetera. We saw this last, I think it was two weeks ago with Lagarde or um, with other um, people from um, government. We need, that's true, certain regulations and we will see that coming more and more. So Felix, I hand over to you now, please. And yeah. welcome again. Uh, thank you, Zina, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, so Felix Fernandez is my name. I'm co-founder and CEO of uh, Open Metric Solutions. Um, <clears throat> as you can see on the right upper corner, we are a spin-off from ETH Zurich. Um, and what we do is we bring uh, the latest academic research in the context of uh, risk management, portfolio management um, into the market. Uh, and uh, cryptocurrencies um, in general are a topic where we already started researching in 2019, potential applications for it. And uh, the topic today is basically re reviewing what we presented uh, last year. Um, does it add value? Um, and um, the, how, how this picture evolves. With no further ado, um, this is one of our main quotes. The reason for that is it, it describes well our philosophy um, that we're focusing on measuring um, market data or financial markets. And I will come in a minute to explain why this is relevant and why we are convinced that this is also from a mathematical standpoint, um, the, the right way to look at it. Uh, as mentioned before, so we are spin-off. We have been founded in 2016. Um, we're building on a long track record uh, of technologies which have been developed in ETH. We serve as a solution provider to the industry and we are ongoing uh, invested in uh, further research and transfer of this academic research into commercially vi viable products and services. Uh, briefly about uh, our background in terms of, of concepts and content. Uh, many providers do not provide uh, transparency about their methodology and sometimes they are black or at least gray boxes. Um, as we started our journey with um, pension funds, our first client was Publica, the largest pension fund in Switzerland and also the pension fund uh, of ETH. Um, and the task at that time was to improve their risk management um, by let's say new and modern uh, statistical methodologies. Um, and all, all the things we do um, are based on this research. So we are quite transparent about um, how we work, uh, what, why the results are as they are, and where we provide the added value is not only based, let's say, on this uh, research work, it's also the correct implementation and industrial quality implementation um, in order that uh, professional clients, institutional clients can use that. Now, getting to the topic a little bit and why it's important to think about um, how to manage risk properly. Um, the, the claim here or the, the main message is um, that it is a far more sensible approach to focus on precise measurement. We call that nowcast. It's a term which has gained also some traction in the industry in the meantime, instead of forecast. Um, the reason for that has a is a very clear and, 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 uh, and solid mathematical uh, uh, basis. So basically, when we deal with any kind of system, uh, be it financial markets, uh, weather, or planetary orbits, uh, it is a stochastic system. So the stochastic system is, has basically two components. One is random, so purely a random component, and the other one is a purely deterministic component. Uh, and well, this, these exist in theory. In reality, probably everything are a combination of stochastic, a combina combination of both. Um, so where we have stochastic system, which means that on one hand, a random system cannot be cannot be predicted by definition because uh, there are no patterns. And on the other side, deterministic systems um, can be well 
um, forecasted and, and, and modeled. Uh, but there are also components in there, which is basically this chaotic component, which we, which which also calls a butterfly effect. Then, when you have uh, such a model from a certain prediction window uh, in looking into the future, uh, small changes in the input variables generate large changes in the output variable. And to make it a little bit more transparent, what this means in practice, um, we can predict planetary orbits quite well for several million years. But not to infinity. So there, there are still effects in there um, which distort. They are small, but they distort these planetary orbits, planetary orbits that we cannot exactly say where, for example, the Moon uh, or the planet Earth stands in 10 or 20 million years from now. This may not seem relevant, but it helps to understand the mathematical limitations of it, which is called Lyapunov time. This was discovered by a Russian mathem mathematician uh, Lyapunov in the 50s, approximately, where he started thinking about what are the, the limitations of any physical system in terms of prediction window. And he came to the, and he proved that every system has a prediction window, which depends on um, let's say how much randomness, randomness is in there and how much deterministic uh, components are in there. Weather is well researched. Um, nowadays, we have quite stable weather forecasts in the range of maybe five days. Um, anything longer gets already a little bit shaky, but there is, um, let's say, the common understanding that regardless of the uh, computational power available, the quality of models, the number of data, weather forecasts will not be uh, precise enough from a certain time window onwards which is expected to be around 10 days or so. So even if we're getting more granular, uh, the prediction window has, an, if you want, a natural a physical end. Financial markets are not that well researched in this regard, but it is common understanding also in the meantime that financial markets obey the same law of physics as other systems. Uh, but there is a, there are, given by the fact that there are many participants, so there are many random components, the, the prediction times are relatively short. So we talk here about prediction times typically in seconds, which um, can be probably exploited uh, by high, high frequency players, uh, but not necessarily by the majority of the market who are not having access uh, to, uh, let's say, the, this, in, these infrastructures. And in addition, these models are typically not very complex. The reason for that is that that models uh, which have to trade basically in seconds or subseconds have to be extremely fast, extremely simple, uh, and typically also molded into hardware. They're not, not longer software based. Um, so what we propose is instead of trying to build a kind of crystal ball um, is to have a better sensor system. And the reason for that is that you have to, in the typical frequency that um, investors work, and do their portfolio rebalancing in their risk management, be it on a daily basis, be it on a weekly basis, or be it uh, on an even monthly basis, um, uh, these time windows are much larger than any uh, prediction window may want. Um, and this is important. And why this is important is especially in a context like cryptocurrencies, where we have to deal with high volatilities, fast changes in the market, typically much faster and much more pronounced than in other asset classes. Um, this is the only mathematical slide, and I promise uh, it, it will not go more complicated than that. But it's important to understand that um, in order to, to um, model uh, financial markets, um, you have to take some kind of approach on how to measure it. And the, the typical measurements is what you can see here in the two bottom slides, which is our bottom charts, which is the trend and the variance. Um, and there's a third dimension, which uh, we call structural break index, and which is the uh, information about different regimes. So when we look at financial market data, they, are not, they cannot be described by just one dynamic, in mathematical terms, one distribution but they can be well described by a series of distributions um, whereby these distributions change. So they're not, not of, of course, not constant. And the typical paradigm is that you have a phase where you have a certain risk phase, 
you have a transition phase and then you have another uh, risk situation. So for example, lower trend, higher volatility or a positive trend and negative volatility. And this transition can be quite fast. It can even take longer. It just depends and you cannot predict that. But what you can do is you can, with the right mathematical method, we use here the Bayesian change point method, um, we can identify these transition points. And then what you see in the bottom chart is basically this, this orange line is a traditional approach where you have, for example, measuring the trend um, by a window. So for example, a 20 day window or a 50 day window or whatever. And then you follow this trend, but you see that the trend is slow. So before this trend changes, because before it gives you an information that something has happened in the market, you are already deep in the new regime. So what is it all about? It's about timing. So having um, a better and more precise information in order to act accordingly. And this is what we do. So we measure properly and we act accordingly so that you are faster to react for market. How is this used in practice? This is a sample for a typical sample for a pension fund for pension fund portfolio, where you see that you have a broad range of different equity indices. You have um, bond indices, uh, commodity indices, uh, currencies, and even uh, Bitcoin involved. Um, and you see that the, this is a very simplified version of it, but it shows in basically one side, and this is the idea, the portfolio manager can immediately see, okay, red is not good and green is good. So like uh, any, any kind of traffic light model, um, and yellow is somewhere in between. And this is exactly how it's structured. You can apply this information directly, and this is what we'll show in, in the next slides, um, how to use it and what the effects are when you apply this to just one uh, or several asset classes. Um, and now coming to the point, what is the added value um, for cryptocurrencies added to traditional portfolios? Um, as Sina rightly said, when, uh, the, when Bitcoin started as the first um, successful cryptocurrency and later on coming others on board, uh, the first investors were more, let's say, specialists, geeks, entrepreneurs. Um, so people who are willing to, to take higher risks, uh, but typically not at a larger scale. So far away from the institutional players who have to deal with, with, with typically broader portfolios, existing portfolios, and um, also from any kind of, of, of let's say, um, typical professional inv investor like um, high net worth, family offices, or private banks. Um, they all have either themselves or for their clients a portfolio covering different asset classes. In order not to make it here too complicated, we just started with a very simple question. Um, what is the added value of adding a small proportion um, of a crypto asset? In this case, we took a Bitcoin. Why? Well, it has the, the longest history. So in order to, to get a better, better picture um, how it works and, and what is the added value. And this is also something which has been proposed already a while ago, for example, by the Yale endowment, um, which has been uh, quite on the forefront of this topic and they themselves uh, invested uh, one or two or three percent in, in their own portfolio. And this has been copied by many. So the question is, does it help if you have an existing in a global global market or global equity market portfolio and you add uh, cryptocurrency to it in a small proportion? And the answer is yes, indeed. So what happens, and you can see this, let's say asymmetry, uh, uh, beneficial asymmetry, that if you look at volatility, the volatility is very similar. The maximum drawdowns are very similar if you have such a portfolio in contrast to the MSCI world. Um, but the annual analyzed returns are much higher, which creates a much better risk-adjusted return ratio. Just to explain the slide also, um, on the bottom you see basically the weights. Here the weight is, as you can see, constant, 96% MSCI world, 4% uh, Bitcoin and rest of it. Uh, in the middle slide, you see the, the drawdowns. The blue line uh, is the index, is the benchmark, and the green line is the portfolio. And you see then on the top side, uh, the green line is over the time, uh, basically um, continuously, it's getting more and more distance to the blue line, which is good. It means that there is a consistent um, additional value in terms of, of additional portfolio.
performance generated by this approach. In such a portfolio, you are 100% invested. <clears throat> and this may not be suitable uh, for all of you. Therefore, the other question is, okay, if you look at it from another perspective and allow uh, for using a, a risk management approach or introduce a risk management approach. I will start here from the bottom slide because it explains or it visualizes quite well what happens here. Uh, you see that these darker blue mountains, um, they have some, there are some areas like between 2015 and 2016 where they are reduced in weight, which means there is less exposure into these. And what is, what is in light bl blue uh, is what we call the, uh, our base portfolio, which is a, a portfolio which consists um, of uh, bonds and precious metals, which is um, dedicated or, or intended to, to be uh, a cash alternative. Why? Because in reality, um, you don't you want to avoid larger phases uh, without being invested and just keeping cash because you're typically getting penalized for that so at least negative interest rates um uh, plus plus inflation so it's not good to to keep for a longer period a larger amount of cash in your portfolio so here what the methodology does it it allocates on a dynamic basis between the six regions of the msci world why because it makes sense to do that um, where the MSCI world has a relatively static allocation to these six regions. If you do this on region level, you can better control in, in phases, for example, around 2017, yeah, where uh, the US part, the MSCI North America in this regard has been reduced and other uh, have been increased and so forth. Now, looking at the, at the benefits, the benefits are quite obvious when you just look uh, at the volatility first. So it reduces volatility, but it also reduces, and this is in a portfolio context even more important, um, the maximum drawdowns. Um, but what comes on top of it is that it even increases uh, the uh, performance significantly. So you're getting a sharp ratio around 1.7, which is very good. So when you see an investment which has a sharp ratio of 1.7, or more than one, you're already uh, on a very in a very good territory, um, and this is the added value of combining uh, crypto assets uh, into a traditional portfolio in a um, dynamic fashion. So again, this is on a static fashion. So this is very simple; can be done without further ado. You can do this yourself uh, and do a, a, a regular rebalancing. And this year, you have to add any kind of, of risk management you trust in. And basically control the weights. So this is these are the differences. Um, to give you a more complete overview or a simplified overview, just by uh, one data point, if you want, the traditional risk return uh, perspective, where you have um, on one hand uh, on on the horizontal axis, uh, you have the risk determined by volatility. You have on the vertical axis, you have the analyzed return, and you see that adding a fixed proportion of Bitcoin to a to to an equity portfolio uh, increases the return without um, increasing the risk. So basically, the same what the, the same information, of course, that, that we have seen before, but here visualize. And then, if you add a dynamic layer, you move this uh, on mod to the left, which is good. So which is increases, of course, the sharp ratio because you're having less risk. And here on the, this table, you see the summary. Uh, just one note, I've seen that there is already one question. I would suggest that we are finalizing, uh, it's, it's quickly over, finalizing the presentation, and then we take questions um, all together. Now, <laughs> uh, looking into expectations to 2021. 20, um, so I would fully agree with Zina that, um, uh, let's say, crypto assets, especially Bitcoin, are here to stay. So uh, we don't think that this will disappear. It's a new technology which creates significant um, benefits for the financial industry. That's also the only reason why it's getting more and more recognized. Uh, and the focus is here, like point, basically point two, the underlying technology allows for many applications. Um, and for some, we are maybe even not, not understand yet, um, which allow also for a significant transformation of the financial services market. Um, 
the third point, which is important for investors, re reliable exposure to Bitcoin is basically mainstream. So you can buy cryptocurrency ETPs like 21 shares on any regulated exchange um, from retail to institutional class. Um, on the other side, you can, of course, buy then uh, cryptos directly. There are several uh, crypto exchanges with deep liquidity uh, and in the meantime also with, with uh, uh, let's say, secure um, with, with secure infrastructure uh, so that is, it is really becoming a mainstream asset. Nevertheless, um, no one can predict the future and no one can say what will happen with the future price development of Bitcoin. Um, there is typical under, common understanding that there is and will be high volatility um, and that it may be driven by uh, larger market players and by uh, any kind of regulatory reaction. So uh, long story short, in investors have to consider this um, and basically they can use it either by uh, controlling the maximum exposure, which we have shown in example one, so just a tiny portion uh, can create already significant value or uh, as an alternative use a sound risk management process instead. So that's from my side. Thank you uh, for staying uh, with us. I will hand over to Zina again. In, in case you have uh, any questions, please contact Zina. She will also be sharing the presentation. And I will skip now, Zina, to your slides and you can take over. Super. Thank you very much, Felix, for this um, very interesting um, um, presentation. And um, so we have more or less than actually the same, uh, the same outlook for 2021. Um, so we didn't speak together. So that it was really funny when we came up a little bit with the, with the same um, solutions, right? With the same um, conclusion, sorry. So um, our solution for you, please the next slide. I think most of you guys already know because I saw that I know most of you um, in the webinar now. We have the perfect solution for you, for your portfolio, actually. So the one of our best uh, best sellers, I have to say, is the ABTC Bitcoin ETP, uh, which is, has a very great product structure. We know it's for retail and for institutional clients, physically backed 100%. It's one of the safest and most liquid way to introduce to your portfolio. We also have, like I mentioned in the beginning, we have a short ETP, um, Bitcoin ETP, which you can use also to hedge in case you'd like to do that. And all of our liquidity from our ETPs are, um, are measured or are done by our independent market makers. So liquidity is not an issue at all for our ETPs. Um, maybe next slide. So all of it is, like I mentioned before, it's 100% collateralized, open-ended structures. You can go in and out anytime, even for very big tickets, no problem at all. And we are regulated like on the regulated exchanges. Uh, we cover the whole DACH region, like I mentioned, in, the US, in um, Switzerland and in the EU. And uh, we have, we are actually the one, the issuer, one of the largest uh, product suit. We have um, 12 ETPs in Swiss francs, euros, US dollars, and GBPs. And I would say like we go maybe to uh, the questions. And I saw there is already a question, um, but the person said, uh, I have to leave now, sorry. Can you please send the PDF and link of the webinar? Yes, we will send this to everybody. That will be done. Second question to you, Felix, maybe. What will be, can we also implement this for a fixed income portfolio? But I don't want that you answer now this too long because I think it will be our next webinar. So I think the people can read our minds, but maybe just shortly, Felix. Yeah. Um, well, we have been, maybe the, the story behind this, we have been asked by a larger bank uh, to um, assess the potential of adding uh, cryptocurrencies to bond portfolios. So now you may ask, um, does it make sense? And the answer is yes. Um, and just adding a small proportion uh, to bond portfolios creates a significant value. And for those who wonder uh, that uh, cryptocurrency is a complete, uh, complete cryptocurrencies are completely completely different beast. Yes, they are. But when you scale them down, you have a similar sharp ratio like uh, bond. So this as a teaser, 
should maybe interesting for those who are wondering how they can enhance their uh, bond portfolio performance without uh, significantly increasing risks. How do how do you how much do you know, um, suggest in general to add to a portfolio? I know, but my I think my opinion people know already. We say between half a percent and five percent, depending of course on the size and the risk structure. What do you say, Felix, for from from outside? Um, I would fully agree. I would say if you add this on a, st a static fashion, so keeping basically a constant ratio. Uh, five percent um, is a rather meaningful maximum. Um, you know that we are all human, so uh, if if we see good performance, we tend to uh, to want more. Uh, and then uh, what what can happen is that you allow your portfolio to grow beyond this uh, threshold. But uh, what you should also understand is that you're changing then your risk return structure. So risk is changing. So looking at from a risk return perspective, I would fully agree anything between 0 0.5 and 5%. If you are adding a, a dynamic structure, so where you control basically the risk and you decide based on this risk control, um, how much do you add, um, the range is between 0 and 10% or 0 0.5 and 10% doesn't matter. The reason for that is very simple. The average exposure is also around 0 0.5 because the risk management tells you in some cases to go up to 10 and in some cases it tells you to go down to zero so on average you're having also a very similar and, and this is consistent with um, our analysis a very similar behavior uh, if you do this so uh, to, re to resume up to five percent on a fixed basis up to ten percent on a dynamic basis great thank you felix last question maybe um if I want to buy, if I want to buy your ETPs for twenty million, will this move the markets? And is this possible? Is it liquid? Yes, it's maybe a question for myself. You can buy any amount you'd like. There is no minimum amount. There's no maximum amount. With this independent market makers we have, which is Flow Traders or Chain Street, we have always the best prices. We have a very very short um, spread, by the way, much uh, much lower than other ins other uh, products have in general. And uh, yes, you can buy and sell any time because it's also important how you can get, go out, not how, how you can in actually. So if you buy for 20 millions, um, you, you can pro probably you would do an OTC order and uh, we can help you with the market makers and it would be no problem at all. That's a guarantee. I don't know if someone has any other question. Otherwise I would say like, Felix, something from your side? No, um, I have to say thank you, uh, Zina, for organizing that. And Maybe uh, next slide. <laughs> kind, kind organization, yes, of course. Very good, thank you. Yeah, the any questions slide. <laughs> That's normal, the oracle, you know, for how to say like what will happen for this year. And maybe I can add just if you put maybe the next slide. If you have any questions in the future, just contact me, no problem, anytime. People who know me know I will answer in general right away or even during the day. And uh, we have a great internal research team. We have newsletters which can help you um, really. We have a great, great piece which comes out every quarter, which is in English, German, Italian, French, for those who speak French also. And we are very happy to help you um, for any of your questions of your clients. And we're always here for you. I would say like, thank you very much in the name of 21 Shares. Thank you very much, uh, Felix Fernandez, to be with yeah. us today as the Thank guest speaker. Well. And please uh, stay tuned because, like I just mentioned before, we will have another webinar coming up. I think next week, uh, next week, next month, probably, which will be a, a very exciting um, other subject to discuss. Thank you very much, and have a good day then. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.